It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Steve Stockman. Hi, Steve. How are you? Good. Great to be here. Thanks Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for coming on the show. It's nice to have you here. Before I know you got a book to promote, but before we get to the book, I did want to mention a film that you uh, wrote and directed some years ago called Two Weeks. I've been, yes. I've been looking for that. it. <laughs> oh, you remember that one? Yeah? Okay. Yes, I do, yeah. Um, I've been looking for it. I can't seem to find it. But my question was, since I've got you here, is is it more like the big chill or more like home for the holidays? Wow. I would say, uh, well, first, let me tell you that you can always find it on Amazon if you want to buy a, a disc copy of it. And it runs on Showtime all the time. Okay. Um, Showtime has it in their permanent library. So they're the ones that stream it. Um so you should be able to find it pretty easily. Um, and I would hate for you not to because I'm proud of it, even though it was a while ago. Uh, it was a good movie. So I would say it's a little more like The Big Chill in the sense that it's it's funny, but it's also fairly emotional. And um, and it's uh, I think there are some some big laughs in it, but um, but there aren't any, you know, car chases, if that makes sense. So. Okay, yeah. Well, I always like films about sort of dysfunctional families that come together, and uh-huh. that's, what, that's what that sort of looks like, at least from the preview. So, um, Oh, yeah, this was, uh, this was highly dysfunctional. Um, you know, it's about four siblings who come home to their mother's house in North Carolina for what they think are the last day or two of her life, and she hangs on, and they're all stuck there together looking at each other, sort of wondering what's going to happen next. And uh, it's got a great cast. It's got Glenn Howerton from Always Sunny in Philadelphia and Sally Field and uh, Julianne Nicholson, who's phenomenal, Clea Duvall, Ben Chaplin. So it's a, it's a, it's a pretty good movie, if I do say so. Yeah. Well, it looks really good. I love Sally Field. And, uh, Thanks. Yeah. So, so, you know, anything she's in, I, I pretty much would watch. So, okay. Yeah, she's pretty terrific. Well, I'm going to definitely make a better effort to... Uh, to find it. It's on the short list. So Yeah, please buy 20, 20 copies. <laughs> Stocking stuffers. Christmas is coming. Exactly. That's yeah. what, what you want is a, a movie about someone dying. That's perfect. So it, all, um, all your friends. All right. So I know you're here to promote a book, and your book's got a great title called How to Shoot Video That Doesn't Suck. Uh, I rather like that. I got a laugh out of that when I saw the... Uh, your bio come through. I guess my first question is, why? Are you just getting like really angry at watching YouTube and seeing what people think <laughs> is a good video? Well, you know, in the olden days, for people who are who are older than say thirty, um, when we walked through the mall and we saw monitors in the window of the appliance store. And we were on camera because they had a camera pointing at people who walked by. We got excited because nobody was ever on video and nobody knew what to do with video and not everybody could shoot video. And so it was a novelty. But now, uh, you know, any disaster happening or argument, there's 300 video cameras that come out and everything is captured constantly. And the problem is that we're drowning in video and most of it is terrible. And yet people try to kind of share it with us. You know, they'll sit down and go, hey, let me show you my vacation. And then you're stuck there watching 30 minutes of of terrible video. And as a director, uh, not only was I personally offended by that, but I realized from going to, uh, you know, I'd go to parties and it was sort of like being a doctor, except instead of saying, could you look at this boil on my neck? People would go, hey, I just shot this video. Could you look at it? (laughs) And I realized after a while that it was all, it was a lot of the same 
issues. And that was because when in this new video revolution, all these people who were never asked to shoot video before suddenly have the equivalent of a Hollywood studio in their pockets 24 seven, and they don't really know what to do with it. So this is my attempt to cleanse the world of bad video. Oh, well, God bless you. And, you know, I hope that, uh, that people, you know, heed to this sort of advice because just because you can doesn't mean that you should. And I think that that <laughs> is probably something that could apply to everything. I mean, why do people think we care what you had for lunch, that you have to take a picture of it and put it on your Facebook page? I don't get it. Uh, yes. And so part of the thing, this is from being, again, from being a director, it's like one of the things you learn as a director is that your job is to get something across to people in a way that they will benefit from. So if that's you give them a laugh or you scare them or you inform them or you take them on a, an action adventure ride or you um, mystify them and then and then help have them help solve the mystery. Whatever you're doing with someone, you have to take them on a little journey. And that requires a little bit of thought, right? So, so you know, I, I went to, um, uh, when my kids were in, in the cello age, I went to a, a recital of theirs, and I saw this dad set up his tripod, and he put his phone on the tripod, and then he just sort of moved the tripod back and forth across the stage. So he was shooting across the stage for a full 40 minutes. And I thought, this is a guy who doesn't realize that what he's just shot is A, nauseating, and B, he is never going to watch the whole thing again ever because it's not watchable. Um, so, so what I try to tell people is you have to think about video as if you're the audience, and you have to think about how to present your video as if you're the audience. And that means starting with what you're talking about, which is a little bit of editorial decision making on what you shoot and what you don't. Well, the one thing that I find particularly nauseating, since you use that word, was when people strap a GoPro to their head and and they'll uh -huh. be sitting in a car or on a bike or something. And everywhere they look, the camera goes. But the problem is the video doesn't move in the same manner as your eyes would to focus and i mean it literally yeah. can make you car sick uh, it does for me when they pan too fast it's like, oh yeah. god it drives me crazy well, so so here's a solution to that so there are two things i tell people that will change their video a hundred percent instantly okay and the first thing is you want to shoot short shot uh, you know if you watch tv or, or films or um or well done social media videos you'll notice that they're shot in pieces. You know, the camera only shows you one to 15 seconds of anything before right. it cuts and moves on to the next thing. And there's a reason for that, which is that the attention span, that is, sorry, the information delivery span is very short. We get stuff visually really fast. And you can give us a lot more information and keep us more involved if you show us more different things that add up to a story. So if you start shooting short shots instead of long things like the GoPro on the head or the guy in the recital, um, and you then the second thing you do is you focus those shots on someone doing something. So each short shot you take at, say, your holiday uh, dinner is a short shot of somebody doing something. It's dad carving the turkey. It's mom handing out presents. It's someone lighting a menorah. But they're short shots that when you take them all together, you know, the things that you've shot over a two-hour dinner, they add up to a beautiful picture of the event that you will watch again because it's only three minutes long and it has all these great shots in it. Well, I agree. You know, it's funny. Back in the 70s when I was in high school, I took a photography class, still photography. And one of the things mm -hmm. that the teacher said that I won't ever forget is he said, don't take scenery shots. They're boring. Nobody wants to see it. Yeah. Put a person in the shot if you must do scenery. So 
if it's you take you want to take a picture of a mountain, put somebody in front and say, "Here's Dad in front of the mountain," and it's similar to what you just said. Put somebody in it, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, the Empire State Building is going to look the same 50 years from now as it did 50 years ago. And if it doesn't, there's going to be a million photographers on the scene to cover that. So the only important thing about your visit to the Empire State Building is what you and your kids experienced while you were there. Uh, if you just want to picture the building, you can Google it, right? So memories are about people, absolutely. Um, and this is especially true in, in the holidays, um, one of the things to think about is how are you shooting your holidays? If you're going to do short shots and you're going to do focus on people who are doing action, you also want to focus on their faces because that's what changes over time. Um, you want to focus on talking to them about interesting things, you know, and asking your five-year-old, you know, to tell you the story of the pilgrims and Thanksgiving um, because that, five-year-old explanation is going to be really interesting in 20 years when you're sitting with the adult child and they want to see what they were like when they were five. Whereas, you know, two hours of everything going on where you're just waving the camera around, nobody's ever going to watch it again. You know, the one thing I've noticed too is the younger the editor is, the faster the cuts are. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, we change over time, you know, in, in the, uh, in like 1908, when the Lumieres <laughs> and Edison were experimenting with with film, it went back that far. Huh? Audiences, okay. well, audiences were actually scared because they were worried that they were going to get hit by the train coming toward them on the screen. Oh, you know, or at least that was that's yeah. the mythology. Um, and if you look at movies from the 40s, sometimes they spend a long time explaining things that we already understand. And that's because we've been watching videos since we were zero and we really understand it. And kids who are younger were brought up with faster video. So they're used to faster video and they see faster video, but like any other language, it changes over time. You know, the, the video that we do today would be incomprehensible to someone in 1945, much like the slang that we use today would be incomprehensible to someone in 1945 and vice versa. So if you think of video as a language, those kinds of changes make sense over time. Well, okay. Uh, it's a good point. It's just I can't watch one of those videos where it cuts literally every one second. I, I just uh, I can't yeah. do it, you know? Yeah, it can. everybody has their own style. You know, some people like heavy metal music and some people don't, I guess. Um, it's hard for me. I, I can't really judge. I, I'm also, you know, of a certain age, but because I make this stuff for a living, I can see very short cuts and, you know, I think in frames. So none of that stuff bothers me, but I can see where everybody has their own tolerance or, or preference for a pace, for a style. And I think that's great. If it's a music video, I can deal with it better mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the music is really more in the foreground for me. And the video right. is sort of the background. But if it's right. just, you know, uh, some carving the Thanksgiving turkey, like you said, and it cuts yeah. every one second, I, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I can't deal with it. But Yeah, I'm not sure I would recommend that for your Thanksgiving video. I think you might want to think in terms of five or ten seconds. But it's funny, if, you, if you're if you shooting a, a home video this holiday season and you kind of start counting to yourself, and you go one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. When you're pointing at, you know, Uncle Larry sleeping in front of the football game, you're going to find that unless he's doing something interesting, after about four seconds, you're going to be pretty tired of it. Uh, even if you think that you like longer shots, and you're, and that's kind of the power of thinking in these short little pieces of video, is you can see Uncle Larry for four seconds and then go on to the next thing because we get it. Um, but too fast definitely could be too fast for you. No too, fa question. too fast almost gives me a strobe effect. Oh, yeah. Some people are sensitive to that. Yeah. Do you watch the little disclaimers on the movies that uh, are, that you're streaming? Oh, the, the ones that say flash, you know, flash photography yeah, yeah. or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen those. 
I know this is a book. It also says that you're doing video courses. So somebody can uh, to book you to, to go on Zoom and uh, you'll talk about what's in the book, basically? You know, I hadn't thought of that, but no. Um, what I did was I, I actually produced the book into a 22-lesson oh, okay. video course so that you can uh, buy it and stream it uh, at your own pace. And you'll get, you know, examples and exercises and you can sort of see what I'm doing. Because I realized that uh, some people like the book. Some people really prefer the audio book, believe it or not, for a book about video. They, <laughs> they just don't like to read, but they, they learn through audio. And some people want to see the examples and kind of play along as we go. So if you go to my website, which is stevestockman.com, um, there's a, the video course is brand new and that's up there now. We do have to kind of wind this down, but I did have one last question. Is there a different yes. technique between using a phone or using a uh, SLR camera or using one of those old sort of, you know, shoulder mounted? I mean, is there a different approach to using different types of equipment? The answer is yes. You want different tools for different jobs, you know, a GoPro versus a, a phone. But But the real answer is, that equipment isn't what makes the difference in how good your video is. What makes the difference in how good your video is, is who's running the equipment. You know, it's like just because you have a scalpel, that doesn't make you a brain surgeon. And just because you have a really great, expensive Hollywood production camera or the newest phone, that doesn't make you a brilliant videographer. You really have to think about your video and think about how to put it together in a way that you and your audience will want to watch it again and that will intrigue them and excite them and tell a good story. And that's really the trick. And I think you can shoot a great video on anything. Okay. Well, I think on that, we're going to wind it down. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, you said your website was stevestockman.com? Yep. And thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. 